Well, thanks for thanks for right, joining happy, us happy here. How are you doing, um, Mike? Let's let's start at the beginning. Uh, tell me a bit about uh, growing up, your childhood. Uh, okay. Where was that, and how and how was that, and everything? Born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, uh, my father was a trial lawyer. Uh, he had been at the county attorney's office and then um, left the county attorney's office to start a civil practice. And back then there was no mediation. And so he tried a lot of jury trials. And, and so I was one of four children in the family. I was actually, as they refer to me, as the baby of the family. And so I had uh, the oldest was my sister, Polly. Uh, and then uh, I had my brother, Bob, who's practicing still at McGrath North. Uh, we had a sister, Mary, who was um, uh, had some, some issues with birth trauma and uh, uh, died in her 50s, and then uh, myself bringing up the rear. And um, it was interesting growing up. We, we lived in Dundee, you know, back, that was back in the days where we never closed our, our front door at night, and, and uh, every kid played in the neighborhood. and. Uh, we actually had a horn that my, my parents would blow that would tell us it was time to come home. A specific pitch yeah. for, for the household so you know which horn it is, right? Yes, ex <laughs> exactly. And, you know, we had a bunch of families on our, we grew up on uh, the corner of 52nd and Birch Street. And so on our street, there were, I believe, three families that had more than 10 children growing up. And so, you know, there were constant uh, pickup. Uh, baseball games, uh, you know, street hockey, and you know, just uh, move to the side when the car comes by. Um, we had uh, a little area that, that people in the Dundee area know about. It's called Sunks. Yeah. Uh, I think formerly Sunken Gardens, and we would go down there and play football. And uh, it was just a great area growing up. I mean, I had a really, really wonderful childhood. Uh, what's relevant to my practice is that my dad, being a trial lawyer, would use the family at family dinners as kind of a focus group. And so many, many nights we'd be sitting at dinner and my dad would say, hey, um, I've got a fact situation I want to run by you. And, and he'd tell us the, the facts of the story and then he'd want each of us to talk about it. And what we thought was the appropriate resolution or who was right or who was wrong. And it got all of us thinking at a very early age about um, uh, legal issues. And, and frankly, um, that's when I decided I wanted to go to law school. And I think my brother did the same. Yeah. And my sister uh, was interested in going to law school, but that was back at a time where not many women were going to law school. And so uh, she ended up uh, getting her master's degree and, and practicing for a while in Chicago where she met her husband, who uh, unfortunately was a, a juvenile onset diabetic and died probably 20 years ago from a series of strokes. Uh, and then at that point, my sister moved out to San Francisco and then recently has relocated to Phoenix, where she has a daughter uh, who is an assistant U.S. Uh, uh, attorney down there. Um, and uh, with a, a, a husband who is a district court judge and they have two children. And then she also has a son who, in Lincoln who is an attorney as well, who works for the state and the environmental department. So you're so, telling me there's a lot of, lot of attorneys in the family. There are a lot of yeah. attorneys in the family. And, and of course I have a nephew, Dave Mullen, who is a Fraser striker. He's my brother's son. And um, uh, so uh, there are a lot of Mullins around, and there are some Mullins that aren't related to us, but still are lawyers. Right. So the Mullen name is pretty popular in the legal field. Right, the other Mike Mullen is out there. The other right. Mike Mullen, who misspells his last name, I might add. <laughs> but we get each other's mail frequently, so. Um, so you, you decided early on to go to law school and, and kind of follow your, your father's footsteps in that, mm -hmm. in that profession. Um, where where'd you end up going for undergrad and, and law school? Sure, I went to, to prep for, for high school, got, a, I thought, a wonderful education there. Uh, and then from there, I went to University of Notre Dame. And I have to put in a plug for Notre Dame because um, uh, they just won uh, their super regional, beating the overall number one seed. 
And so we're really excited that they're coming to uh, uh, Omaha for the College World Series on Friday. In fact, I think their first game is Friday. And uh, it was really fun to, to follow them um, through the season. We're, there were times they were ranked in the top 10, times that they were ranked in the top 20. But I think they kind of got gypped out of uh, hosting a regional. But, but you know, you couldn't have scripted it better to be on the road the whole time, uh, uh, get through the regional without a loss and then get to the super regional to play the best team in the country. Some are calling them the best baseball team of all time in college baseball and then to win in a three game series. And yesterday's game was, you know, a classic uh, baseball game back and forth, back and forth. So, um, but that's, uh, I had a wonderful four years at Notre Dame. It was the best time I think to be there. We had national championships in football and, uh, 73 and 77, I was there when Notre Dame basketball uh, beat UCLA's 88-game win streak in January of 74. Um, and uh, then my senior year in basketball, um, uh, uh, Notre Dame in our very last home game uh, of our basketball season, we beat at the time, uh, I believe it was number one ranked University of San Francisco with Bill Cartwright. Wow. who came in and uh, uh, we knocked him off at home in uh, my very last college basketball game that I attended at Notre Dame. And uh, so it was a wonderful time there. And, and I uh, was on the boxing team, believe it or not, with, of all people, Rudy of uh, the movie fame. Yeah. And uh, quite a bit different than portrayed in the movie, but interesting character. The boxing team. Yeah. So. Uh, were you wearing full headgear or yes. was it? Okay. Yeah, it was like collegiate. And, and at that time, most schools didn't have a college boxing team, but the military academies did. And uh, But that was about the only thing. Uh, Notre Dame's program was set up as more of an intramural uh, tournament, um, but it was very popular, particularly with the football players. And so I believe my senior year, um, I uh, maybe it was my junior year, uh, 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 Ross Browner, who I believe was uh, both uh, 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 in the College Football Hall of Fame and the NFL Hall of Fame, uh, uh, fought Ken McAfee, who was the legendary tight end at Notre Dame, um, in a wonderful boxing match. I think either one of them could have gone pro in boxing, but they decided to go into to, to football instead. But it, it was neat because not only did I get to participate with these guys, I got to become friends with them. And, and it was just a wonderful event. I'm still in contact with a lot of my old boxing friends. But, you know, I, I've lost due to health issues uh, about six, well, now, as of today, 55 pounds in the last year. Uh, but I'm still, uh, 40 pounds over what I boxed at at Notre Dame. So yeah. I was really in good shape and worked out three hours a day in addition to all the studying. You so. know, I, I, you think about boxing, I think like Teddy Roosevelt, like, mm -hmm. you know, old time college boxing and everything like that. I, I never even thought about it as, as a collegiate sport. Um, but I mean, Notre Dame's got the traditions that go back yeah. forever, right? Well, it's That's called right. Bengal Bouts and all the proceeds um, from the Bengal bouts would go to the uh, Holy Cross missions in Bangladesh. And that was the big push. They were, um, it wasn't so much that we were gonna play the service academies in a, a, a competitive match, but uh, it was more intramural. Anybody could sign up that wanted to fight. Now they're doing female boxing back in Notre Dame for Bengal bouts. Um, but I actually fought, um, not because of me, obviously, but because of some of the football players that were on the card. Uh, they would get uh, uh, 8,000 or more people for some of these boxing matches wow. and do it uh, in the ACC where the basketball team plays. Yeah. And so it was really a fun way to, 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 to get into sports. I, I was certainly not going to make any of the, the other uh, sport teams there at my size, but at 132 pounds, um, you know, I was a little taller than most of the other boxers in my weight class, so I had a little bit better range, but, um, but it was a, a way to, to get into shape, and I really enjoyed that. And then my brother's old roommate was the head of the program, uh, who was a, a four-time Bengal Bow champion and, and just a wonderful guy. Wow. So, but Rudy uh, boxed uh, uh, two of the years that I was boxing, so. <laughs> and and um, 
Did anyone get knocked out or oh, was yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, there were knockouts. There were uh, more technical knockouts because of the use of the headgear. Yeah. And the, the gloves that we used were generally two ounces larger than what you would be using in an actual, um, for example, Olympic event or a professional uh, yeah. uh, event. So it was, it was, the, the safety was a big thing for, um, at the time I was there, his name was Nappy Napolitano who had been uh, running the Bengal Bar program for decades, wonderful man, everybody loved him. Uh, but he wanted to make sure no one got badly hurt. You know, people were getting knocked out and, you know, cuts and broken noses, you know. Um, but other than that, uh, it, nobody got seriously hurt. Well, and I suppose uh, all your uh, friends are calling you up saying, hey, I'm coming to town for CWS now, right? I had a lot of texts yesterday, yeah. Texts and emails uh, with people, um, uh, uh, some were giving me kind of a hard time saying that, oh, they're supporting Oklahoma and they, you know, hope that Oklahoma can beat Notre Dame and, and what, ha what have you. But a lot of people got a lot of congratulatory emails because everybody knows that I'm a big Notre Dame fan. I'm, I'm probably an even larger Creighton fan. Um, I would have loved to have seen Creighton make the, the College World Series as they did a number of years ago. but. And this is Notre Dame's first trip back after 20 years. Their last visit was 2002. And of course, I went to those games and yeah, it was exciting baseball. Yeah. So, uh, What was your major in college? I was government, which is considered pre-law. Yeah. I, I knew going to, well, I knew by the time I was at prep, I wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, practiced with my father and with my brother. And uh, I very, very luckily had the opportunity to do that. And so as soon as I, I started clerking with my father's firm, uh, when I came back, went to Creighton Law School. And frankly, I spent more time uh, working and clerking than I did going to class, but managed. I, Pretty good education in the workplace, though, right? Yes, it was, well, fan, frankly, a lot better than learning, um, you know, about uh, the rule against perpetuities that I would never use in my entire practice. but. Um, but you have to know the stuff too. You have to know the law and you have to pass the bar exam and you have to know that information to pass the bar exam. Uh, but, but I studied enough to, to be able to, to get, you know, decent grades, um, and to pass the bar exam. And that's what I wanted to do. But I did learn a lot. Uh, I actually tried some cases, bench trials as a senior at law school, uh, because Creighton and the Supreme Court here had a program where you could become a senior certified um, uh, law student, which gave you the right with supervision to actually try cases. Yourself. How'd it go? Oh, it went fine. I, I won two bench trials my senior year. So it was great. And yeah. so it, it just kind of got me more acclimated that as soon as I passed the bar exam uh, and was sworn in by the Nebraska Supreme Court, I was able to just uh, start trying cases. I, I think I tried four jury trials my first year as a, uh, uh, a lawyer out of law school. And so you went in with your dad's firm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the firm at the time? It was Boland, Mullen, and Walsh. Okay. And George Boland was an extremely well-known, um, long deceased now, uh, a trial attorney. Uh, and then Tom Walsh uh, was also a well-known trial attorney, actually uh, had a stroke, I believe, trying a case uh, down in Texas and, and died shortly after that. Wow. But he literally you know, died with his wingtips on. Um, and my father uh, practiced until um, uh, he had a number of heart issues later in life. And, and finally, uh, after we had merged with McGrath North, which we did in, I believe it was 88, 1988, um, he, he got to a point where my wife, not my wife, my mother would actually drive him down to the office because he could no longer drive. Oh, wow. And he would go up and, and read his mail and, and walk around and talk with the attorneys and the secretaries, loved talking to secretaries. And uh, uh, just that's what he loved to do. He yeah. couldn't, couldn't stay away from the office. Yeah. So. And, um, and, and your brother was there too. So what was the size of that firm before it merged with McGrath? It, we had, I believe, uh, nine lawyers when we merged with McGrath North. And um, uh, two of them are now deceased, uh, um, uh, Terry O'Hare and Tim Pugh. And then um, 
another one of the attorneys uh, was uh, Mary Likes, who became a district court judge until her retirement. And then another one who you would know very well was Scott Paul. It's, so, it's bringing up memories of the yeah. interview with him, actually. Yeah. yeah. And he called it a boutique litigation firm, hev heavily litigation, mm -hmm. um, which other firms are saying they're full service, but this was this was litigation. Strictly, and boutique was the name that, that we were called frequently because yeah. we didn't take anything on. We, we didn't do estate planning. We right. frankly didn't know how to do anything but to litigate and try cases. Mm -hmm. And so that's all we did. Okay. Um, and were you... When did, you, when did you get married? Uh, when when did you and your family? Got married in 1983, which was three years after graduating from law school. And um, interestingly, um, my brother and his wife uh, were friends with um, uh, another uh, couple who uh, the attorney's name was John Tiedemann and his wife, uh, Nan Leader Tiedemann. And uh, when my wife Joni moved to Omaha for a job from Sioux City, um, and I think it was actually um, Nan Tiedemann who called me up and, and said, hey, how would you like to go on a blind date? And I said, well, not really. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they, they, those had not worked out in the past. And uh, she basically talked me into it and uh, couldn't have worked out better. We had a wonderful time on our first date. and. Uh, the rest is history, and we just celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary um, on May 14th, just about a month ago. Congrats. Where yeah. was that first date? Uh, it was to a place called Gallagher's. Um, and the funny thing is, we actually had plans to go to dinner at Gallagher's. It was in Shaker Place okay. on, yeah. you know, um, I think Mike Dyer's office is in that same, of course, now they're renovating everything. Uh, but it was a very popular restaurant. We were going to go there and go see a movie, but uh, we enjoyed the conversation so much, we never made it to the movie. We just sat there and had our dinner and then sat around and talked, um, had a couple more drinks, and, and uh, 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 I thought it was, uh, and I think she agreed, that it was very, um, we became very compatible. Better than going and watching a movie and, and sitting there not talking and, yes. and staring at the screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... How, how, how long were you doing litigation before you started to get into mediations? Well, I started doing um, uh, uh, mediation. Um, well, I'm, I'm gonna go back uh, because in 1991, I had an incident where I had a case going to trial um, and I basically got along with everybody. And, and the other attorney called me up and said, hey, Mike, um, you remember John Miller, and of course everybody remember John Miller. Wonderful man, wonderful trial lawyer, uh, but just a really uh, deeply, he was a man of faith, and, and he retired at a relatively early age because he got tired of the animosity and the hostility associated with, with litigation, and he, he ran his father's art gallery, Miller Art Gallery, on uh, about 71st and Pacific. Um, but he got tired doing that after a year or two, kind of got bored, I think, and wanted to come back to the law, but he wanted to do it in a peaceful way. And I, I heard all this later, um, but, but, but when I got the call from the other attorney, he said uh, John Miller had come out of retirement and was now conducting mediations. And it's, it's strange to hear me say this now, but at the time I said, well, what's mediation? I mean, it just wasn't used around here. And uh, he said, well, the other attorney said, well, I don't know, I've never done one either, but it's like he facilitates settlement negotiations. Yeah. And I said, well, I'll give it a try. We were three or four weeks out from a trial. And, um, and lo and behold, John in his, you know, very, very gentle, uh, uh, professional demeanor um, uh, was able to get that case resolved in a half day. And, the parties loved him, and, and even though both parties said that they had compromised more than they wanted to, they were both really happy to get out of the litigation process. So from there, I started to mediate more and more of my cases, most of them with John Miller as, a, a, as me being a trial lawyer, using John Miller as the mediator. And I know I mediated over 100 cases with him over the course of the 1990s, and he was masterful at getting cases settled. Um, 
and invariably my clients preferred that process over litigation and having to go to trial. So um, in 1999, I thought to myself, boy, I, I, you know, my clients much prefer um, mediation, although it was, I, I was not trying as many cases as I had previously done, and I love trying cases. Um, I kind of saw that mediation was the future. So in 1999, I took some mediation training and um, uh, sent out a bunch of letters saying I've completed mediation training. You know, if you're looking for a mediator, you know, uh, consider me. And in January of 2000, um, I was hired uh, to do my first mediation and, and luckily got it settled because then I could tell everybody, hey, I've settled every case I've mediated as a neutral. And then I got a second mediation and I got that settled. So then my message was, well, I've done multiple mediations and I have a 100% success rate. And so I um, uh, started doing mediations at McGrath North. Um, and then I was contacted by uh, an attorney here. Um, and uh, basically, Bart McClay was the head of the litigation department at that time at, at QTAC Rock. And the firm management had charged him with trying to find a new um, a new uh, income stream for litigation, you know, something that they, the firm had not been doing before. So uh, the firm contacted me and said, how would you like to come to QTAC and, and mediate full time? And um, I thought about it for, you know, uh, maybe uh, three or four seconds and, <laughs> and said, yeah, I, I certainly want to do it. But I, I also have been working very closely with Amy Van Horn and uh, she had picked up all of my, my clients because I was doing more and more um, uh, mediation by that point. And I, I asked if she could come along and um, they said, by all means, we'd love to have Amy. So Amy and I uh, came over here about 15 years ago and um, I just started mediating every day from that day till, till now. And Amy did my litigation, um, handled my clients until she saw how happy I was and how satisfied and fulfilled I was um, doing the mediation. So about five years ago, she came to me and said, hey, Mike, uh, you know, could I, would, would you mentor me to, to be a mediator? I said, absolutely. And so, um, you know, she started doing mediations and uh, uh, she's just in the last couple of years really taken off. I know her numbers, I just talked to her last week, her numbers are up about uh, I think she said 50% over last year, and she's now having weeks where she's mediating every day. Wow. And I get nothing but rave reviews about Amy. So she's only the, um, there, there, there are, of course, uh, quite a few female mediators, uh, but most of them are doing family law, divorces, uh, parenting plans, things like that. And, and Amy's one of the few female mediators who's doing civil litigation, the same kind of thing that, that I'm doing. Okay. And uh, uh, she's doing fantastic, and, and uh, I think she's having a ball doing it, just like I've had a ball doing it. Yeah. So We've, we've had a CLE with you before, mm -hmm. uh, John Brownrigg and, and Mike yeah. Kinney, and um, I, don't want to give, I don't want you to give away the secret sauce, mm -hmm. but for those who aren't quite familiar with, with the details of it, and and sort of the process. Uh, are you um, generally doing these with um, people, the clients and their attorneys are in separate rooms and you're shuttling between the two with, with their offers and yes. not really having them all in one space? Yeah, I, I generally believe that the it's called the caucus method of mediation is, is more appropriate for uh, civil disputes. And, and when I say civil dispute, it could be anything from personal injury, wrongful death, uh, employment disputes, um, uh, professional negligence, medical malpractice, uh, legal malpractice, uh, business disputes. Uh, generally, the caucus session works better, I believe. Uh, and some there, there are going to be some mediators around the country who would disagree with me on that. I think the majority do agree with me uh, because that allows the attorneys and the parties to be more open in their discussions with me than if they're sitting across the table from their adversary and they won't admit anything and everything is positional and argumentative. And so 
Uh, I think that makes it harder to get a case to a resolution. I've got to cut through the BS, um, you know, and I'll do um, in uh, 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 some mediation, certainly not all of them, I'll get either the attorneys together in a room for a joint caucus, or sometimes I bring the parties together in a room for a joint caucus without the attorneys being present. If I think the attorneys are being obstructive, I'll try and get the parties together. Um, and a, a really good example of that where I think it works is where there are two businesses. It's a business dispute, uh, could be a commercial dispute, and the attorneys are, you know, uh, appropriately, you know, uh, working really hard, but billing a lot. And, and I love getting the two, if they're CEOs or high level uh, uh, executives together in a room. And the first thing I tell them is, well, uh, gentlemen or uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know that um, if this case goes forward, the only ones guaranteed to win are your attorneys. Um, and you ought to find a way, even if it involves non-monetary terms, you ought to find a way to get this dispute resolved on terms that both of you can agree to. And in a high percentage of those instances, um, the parties come up with their own terms and end up shaking hands and walk out with an agreement. And then they tell their attorneys that they settled the case. And I think it works really well. Yeah. So there are times that the, the caucus session uh, can be improved upon, uh, but, but usually at the early stages of almost every mediation, the caucus method is the best way to go. And so that's interesting. So really, you're always thinking about, <clears throat> excuse me, the cost of litigation, the uncertainty of, of a trial, and, and combining that with the potential positions that they're in, right? Mm -hmm. the, the pot is this big right now. We, mm -hmm. we spend more on attorneys. We, we have more uncertainty. I mean, showing them that, mm -hmm. that, that future that could be there, right? And right, right. Saying, we could walk out of here today and you certainly have this, or you could spend more money and maybe get nothing. That's right. I think there are four big benefits to mediation. Uh, one is it saves time. You know, uh, I actually had one case I mediated where the parties had litigated for over 14 years. They'd had two trials, two appeals, two reversals and remands. And when I mediated the case 14 and a half years after the suit had been filed, um, they were getting ready for their third trial. Both sides had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of attorney fees. They had had untold numbers of sleepless nights, all the stress, all the distractions from their businesses and their families. Um, and, and I was lucky enough to get that case settled, but every single party came up to me afterwards and said, boy, we wish we had done this process over a decade ago. You know, it, we, we could have gotten on with our lives. Um, but that was a case where they just didn't want to uh, uh, mediate until, uh, you know, they'd been through the ringer. Uh, and then they realized too late that they shouldn't have done it previously. Uh, but that's one thing. Uh, mediation is a lot less expensive. Let's face it, litigation has, has gotten very expensive from personal injury cases to business cases. Hourly rates are going up, expert witnesses costs are going up and fees are going up. Um, and uh, parties can literally save hundreds of thousands of dollars if they resolve it at mediation. Uh, third, it's a, a non-stressful process. I try to make every mediation easy, gentle on the parties and as non-adversarial as I can keep it. But I think the best advantage of mediation is the fact that it uh, allows the parties to uh, buy certainty of a result. I mean, if they agree on terms, even if they have to compromise to get to those terms, they know what's going to happen, they know what the result is, and they've decided that they can live with it. Uh, I used to tell every client before every jury trial I had, you know, if we try your case 10 times, we're going to get 10 different results because every jury is demographically different from every other jury. And I can't tell you whether we'll get a jury that's good for your side of the case or that's bad for your side of the case. But, you know, uh, uh, and that's the reality of it. But um, if by settling at mediation, even though everybody has to compromise a little bit, uh, if the parties can reach a, a set of terms that they can agree upon, they leave satisfied. Maybe not ecstatic, but but in almost every successful mediation, the parties leave satisfied and they're really, really happy to get out of the litigation process. And remind me, because I'm not 
quite sure in this. So in federal and, and state um, court, district court, is there a requirement for a, a mediation process in, in cases that are going to go to trial? No. Uh, I will tell you that, that uh, in state court, um, the legislature has adopted uh, a statute that gives all the state court judges the uh, authority to order cases to mediation. Uh, and then the parties have the ability to try and opt out by showing good cause that mediation would be unsuccessful or a waste of time. But most of the judges uh, around the state are, are, in fact, if the parties are, they're, first of all, I think most attorneys and parties are willingly entering into the mediation process, right. but those that are not um, uh, are typically ordered by the court to mediate. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, I frankly don't see much of a difference. I'm, I'm settling 90% of the cases that come to me voluntarily and 90% of the cases that are coming to me by order of court. So I, I, it's interesting that, that the uh, rates of success are the same with those parties that frankly may not have wanted to mediate, but they're ordered to go to mediation versus those that want to voluntarily enter into mediation. Um, those numbers sound extraordinary. I'm guessing that's uh, higher than the national average or even the state average. It's probably higher than the national average. I, I'll tell you, we have some wonderful mediators in the state from Amy Van Horn to Mark Christensen to, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to forget the names of some of them. I hate to do that. But uh, we have a number of good mediators in the state. And um, I, I would suspect that their rates are pretty comparable to mine. And, um, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I've missed three or four that they're going to be very angry that I didn't say their names, but. Um, I can delve it in there. We can. Yeah, yeah but, but they're, they're, <laughs> we have, we're, we really have some talented mediators in the state. Mike Kenny, obviously, I didn't say his name. Um, uh, yeah, Tim Engler, um, you know, Con Keating was fantastic when. He was mediating. Brown Rig obviously was wonderful. So I mean, we've had a long history of really okay. strong mediators. What makes somebody good at being a mediator? You know, I, I, that I get asked that question occasionally, and and the thing is, I don't know. I think it it may be more uh, personality than anything, uh, and ability to stay neutral. Um, yeah. Amy gave me an example of a mediation she had. It was actually in another state where she was representing a party. And the mediator, who she had never used before and didn't really know, uh, came in and said to her client, who was being sued after being in an auto accident that caused the wrongful death of the other person. And, and th her client was just terribly, terribly uh, saddened by it and felt uh, guilty and, and was really upset. His life had been turned upside down by having caused another person's death. But the mediator comes in and the first words, according to Amy, to her client were, so how does it feel to have killed that plaintiff? And, you know, uh, she was very angry at that. It, it just, it, it, it doesn't show neutrality. It, it uh, uh, the mediation almost ended at that moment. Sure. Um, and and so there are mediators. And I don't know anybody around here who would use that type of a, a technique, but there are some mediators around the, the country that use styles that I would not, uh, frankly, use myself. And um, but I, I think most of the people around here are extremely good at maintaining their neutrality, being very personable with people, making um, you know we're seeing parties it. And maybe their worst, uh, whether they've lost a loved one or caused the loss of someone else and um, or maybe their business is at risk of, you know, uh, going under if they lose a case. And, and um, uh, you have to realize that these people are going through their worst times and, and you have to get them through it. Um, you know, it's, it's almost kind of like being a midwife, you know, in, in a sense, because uh, you got to get people through the process and get them to an ending that hopefully is a positive ending for them. Yeah. And, and I think it's more personality than anything. And you have different styles of doing it. 
Uh, some are more forceful, some are more gentle, um, and you just got to find the, the right touch to do it. I've, I've heard stories of your prolific um, consuming of facts and details and briefings before um, before cases and and you you truly are very prepared you have mm -hmm. you have details that really are maybe important to the client maybe not to the actual settlement right um, and and that's going to be a big part of, of your success right it's part of uh, I think it, it, it gives me some credibility to know the facts well I mean, you know, since COVID, uh, I've been done well over 650 Zoom mediations. Um, and uh, so people are now dropping materials off in my house. And sometimes it's a banker's box full of documents left on my front porch that I have to review overnight. And, you know, Joni would confirm this, but, you know, many, many weeks, I don't go to bed from, you know, Saturday night to the next Friday night, you know, because every night, I'm up all night, um, you know, and I'll, I'll doze off for a half hour here or there, uh, but I'm just trying to, to uh, you know, uh, absorb as much of the information as I can. I was up all night last night, not all night, but but I, I maybe got an hour or two of sleep, but I've got a terrible wrongful death mediation starting at one today, um, sad, sad facts, um, you know, surviving wife and uh, three children, um, nine grandchildren and three great-grandchildren who thought that their husband, father, you know, grandfather, great-grandfather was the greatest guy alive. And he probably was. And I have to deal with all those emotions this afternoon. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, that does add a lot of credibility, mm -hmm. obviously, to, to understand um, all that. I'm sure there are mediators out there that maybe pride themselves on saying, I'm coming in here and maybe I don't know those details, but I can get you to to solution. But that's that's not yeah. you. That you wouldn't feel that's not my that. style. As a as a litigator, um, previously, you, yeah. you knew your cases frontwards and backwards. And well, like you know, uh, probably the best um, example I can give is a, a, a gentleman in San Francisco um, who is considered uh, the uh, one of the the, the most. Uh, well-known mediators in the country, a uh, guy by the name of Tony Piazza. And a uh, very, very interesting guy. I've met him um, once and had a chance to sit down and talk with him, but um, he's known for being the highest uh, billing mediator. Um, and interestingly, he says, well, every time I raise my rates, um, uh, I get more business. So, <laughs> but, but he has a rule, at least he used to, where, um, he would only allow 25 pages per party. To, and so someone might send him 25 page position statement and then a banker box of exhibits to it and he'll send back the box unopened. And uh, I just don't set any limitations on the amount of materials that people send me. And you know, people sometimes send me thousands of pages to review for one mediation. And yeah. if that's what they want me to read, that's what I'll read. Yeah. So. Um, so the position statement document um, it's sent to you. It's not shown to the other party, so they can. Some send them to the other side. Okay, but but the, uh, that's a minority, um, and and some um, will even send one confidential statement to me, but then they'll send a second statement out and copy in the other side, okay. and that those are it's a great strategy where they're trying to convey some of their best arguments to the other side. Uh, but also to me, admit where they may have some weaknesses. And uh, so that you can take any type of uh, style. Sometimes people would just prefer to talk to me for an hour before a mediation or meet with me for an hour, and I'm happy to do that too. Yeah. So, um, but the whole thing is uh, getting, I think, as much information as possible to be able to help people with their risk assessments. I never make predictions, but I will talk about risk assessments. And um, uh, uh, then people can either listen to me or, or ignore me. If, if they're just sending you the confidential one, can, can they, or do you ask that they put in ranges, you know, for, for what is a decent settlement? Well, you know, they sometimes do that. And, you know, that's helpful. I typically, for example, today, I was given 
the, 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 the plaintiff attorney has indicated where he is going to begin with a, a settlement demand, uh, but the defense attorney has not given any indication what they think the case may be worth, other than um, they think that there are some arguments as to why it may not be as high as the plaintiff thinks because of various issues uh, that, that may affect the, the decedent's life expectancy, um, you know, how long the decedent may be able to work and, and provide uh, uh, monetary benefits to the heirs and next of kin. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, a lot of times we'll give, people will give me some idea where, they, where they're going. But it, it's, it's extremely helpful as a document for, for if the client can see, you know, a, a version of it mm -hmm. um, as, as a snapshot of where you're at in the case on the way to trial. Um, and more of those sort of in the moment briefings on, on everything, weaknesses especially, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. not just the strengths of the case, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, and, and let's face it, the, 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 the more open and frankly honest uh, parties, uh, well, pr particularly the attorneys are, um, <clears throat> in um, uh, giving me their, their weaknesses and strengths, uh, I think the easier it is for me to, to address those issues. But, but if you know, a party runs a red light and uh, uh, claims that the other side was contributorily negligent because they should have seen the, the defendant running the red light. You know, those are the type of arguments that frankly, if they actually argue that a trial would lead to an enhanced verdict. Right. So right. juries get angry with those, with, with people that do not accept responsibility. And, and all the good lawyers that I know are smart enough to accept responsibility when responsibility needs to be accepted. Yeah. Uh, What's your shortest uh, mediation and your longest mediation? Why, uh, uh, my longest mediation was earlier this year. Um, I started a Zoom mediation at uh, 9 a.m. on a Saturday, and uh, we ended at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning. And um, <clears throat> uh, I know you know Steve Bruckner. Um, we were supposed to go to the Bruckner's house for the first time that we really had seen them um, since COVID had uh, commenced and uh, for dinner that night. And so, you know, I'm on the Zoom in my home office and my wife starts sticking her head in saying, you know, Mike, Mike, it's, you know, we're supposed to go over to Bruckner's and you know, doing this. And, um, and then uh, she kept texting me, uh, Steve texted me and finally Ann started texting me, you know, where are you? Aren't you going to show up? And, and I'm, said, I'm trying to get this case resolved. And then I got my wife to agree to, to at least bring me a plate of food home. You know, when she came home and she came home about 11 and came in and saw that I was still on the Zoom. Um, and I said, can you bring me the food? And she goes, oh, I forgot the plate at in the kitchen of the Brecker's house. And I thought, oh God. So she made me a microwave hot dog, which was the only thing I ate during a 23 hour mediation. But you know, uh, it was a hard mediation, but on the other hand, uh, I was able to get it settled. They were all Texas parties and attorneys that got in my name somehow um, to mediate this case. It had nothing to do with Nebraska or the Midwest. Um, and, and you know, it gave me a really good feeling to get it resolved. And then I went to bed. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Uh, has it ever been a, an opening offer? Boom, yes, and they're done, or no? No, never. In, in uh, now uh, over 4,500 mediations, that has never happened. Um, but I would tell you the shortest mediations are ones that, um, and it's really a different category. I, I don't even really call them mediations where it's a, a, a medical malpractice case, but a, a healthcare provider or doctor has said that he is not going to allow any settlement offers to be made on his behalf. And, and uh, doctors are uniquely in a category where they have consent to settle clauses in their liability insurance policies. So uh, if they say, I don't want to offer anything, the insurance company cannot offer anything. And so uh, what, what happens is um, uh, that uh, sometimes those cases are ordered to go to mediation. And I've worked out a, a, a kind of a, a technique where I get everybody on the phone for 
five to 10 minutes and the defendant confirms that there will be no settlement offers. Um, and then I ask the plaintiff uh, attorney if he or she has any questions and they typically say no and then I declare an impasse. Then they can go back and report to the court that a mediation occurred that day. And the deal is I don't bill for that because they only last about 10 or 15 minutes. But the, the, the other side of it is that I don't count it as a loss on my win-loss schedule because I never had a chance anyway. Right. But those are my shortest mediations. The, the, the shortest mediations that occur where parties are actually negotiating uh, typically last an hour and a half to two hours. And I've had, had a number of those that we get to a number pretty quickly. But they typically, because of the opening presentation I give, um, uh, you know, that typically takes 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And then I go talk to each room individually, and then we get the negotiation started. But I can get it done maybe in two steps of back and forth um, uh, uh, in some cases. And it's relatively rare. But uh, I would say the vast majority of the mediations will last anywhere from four hours to, to seven or eight hours. Yeah. Um, what, what, was your dad, um, still around when you started mediating? No, no, he never got to see me do this. Do you know what he thought about mediation at all or? Yeah, he, no, he, it, it was not on his radar screen at all. Yeah. I, I've had a lot of people tell me that, that, you know, older individuals, older attorneys that were, um, you know, perhaps not as old as my father, but, but knew my father, you know, say that they, they think he'd be very proud of me for, for kind of forging a new course. Um, I know he'd be very proud of both my brother and me yeah. and all, all of our, our kids, my, my sister as well. Um, so, um, but I think about him a lot, you know, he, yeah. he was the one who got us into this. Um, so the, uh, I mean, just, the legal process has sort of changed over the years mm -hmm. from when you started and, you know, there would be more, okay, let's go to trial. And, and the pre-trial litigation wouldn't be nearly as severe, right? right. Uh, the amount of uh, time, money spent in, in pre-trial, go, going in for hearings on motions, mm -hmm. things like that, you just go to trial. Yeah, that, right? that was the old style. Right, and 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 so with the, the new version of, well, we can have certainty if we try to do all this before trial. Uh, it kind of gummed up the works, but but brought in or mediation. Probably so. made mediation more attractive because of the time that all that um, uh, discovery now takes and the expense that's associated with all that discovery. It's made mediation more popular, yeah. and and it really uh, uh, enhances the 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 the, 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 the uh, what I think are the you know the elements of. Uh, mediation that are uh, really, really good, and that's uh, it shortens the time period of the and uh, uh, protracted litigation, keeps uh, the litigation expenses to a minimum, and it it allows people to get the cloud of litigation out from over their heads more quickly, yeah. which so it's they, they're able to sleep better at night and get on with their lives. Uh, so, I've heard it said from some attorneys that will remain nameless. Um, that there's just some times that mediation can't work and not necessarily because there's a clause. Well, I guess that's a specific thing with the, the doctors. If they have a settlement, they have to report it and then it becomes an issue with their license. Right. Um, um, and so that aside, just in general, the party's mindset, they won't accept a, a settlement. They need to have a jury or a judge decided. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? In some cases, in some cases that's true. I mean, some people will litigate um, and want a jury to decide simply as a matter of principle. Uh, but I think those cases are really few and far between. Um, I've been told, um, you know, in cases that my client just does not want to settle, um, and and yet the process works in a way where the party who is, is litigating on principle and wants to be heard, can feel heard through the mediation process sufficiently that he or she no longer believes that they need to go to trial to get that principle established that they were 
uh, intending to establish. And so, you know, those I get a great feeling after those where you say, this is a case, Mike, you're not going to be able to get settled. The parties are too far apart. Right. Well, you know, that's a challenge to me, and I love that challenge. And, and sometimes I can't get them settled. But even in those cases, I'll continue to follow it and check in with the attorneys. Uh, sometimes I'll do a mediator proposal um, where I, on my own, uh, I typically get consent from the, the attorneys to do it, but I'll send out a proposed resolution that I think is fair and reasonable um, and uh, give the parties a chance to say yes or no to it. And I've had a, a pretty high rate of success on my mediator proposal. So the whole thing is that you know, I, I, I don't take no easily. And if I don't get a case settled, I'm going to continue to leave it on the floor of my home office now or my office upstairs here prior to the pandemic. And then I obsess about it and I go back and try to get it resolved at a later date. I, I love that you love stats on, on the same way. And I don't want you to be gosh golly humble about this, but if you could put a round number on the amount of dollars you've saved clients and attorney's fees mm -hmm. on the case, I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars at this point. Well, I, I was never a math major. And so my <laughs> math is, is even during mediations, I, I have trouble adding stuff up. But, um, uh, that's why I always have a calculator with me, but, but I would say, you know, after 4,500 mediations, um, probably approaching 4,600 and 90% of them settled, uh, you know, I multiply that by, in some cases, uh, 50,000, in some cases, maybe hundreds of thousands, right. you know, that's where you get to that number. Yeah. But I, I frankly wouldn't have any... I, I, any guess I'd give you, I'm, I'm sure would be wildly wrong. <laughs> we're getting to, we're getting out a lot of digits though. That's yes. for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that's, uh, you, you talk about, um, saving, saving money for the people of Omaha, the, the people, uh, not just of Omaha, of, um, all over that, that you've done, uh, Man, you're you're the best deal out there. <laughs> well, I am. I I mean, compared to the the, the people that I know that have similar, um, you know, numbers of completed mediations and the same range of uh, success rates, um, they're all charging uh, per diems paid in advance of, um, you know. Twenty thousand, thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars. Uh, uh, Tony Piaz, who I mentioned earlier, last I heard, he was sixty thousand dollars per day wow. that you have to pay in advance. And if the mediation blows up in three hours, he's not paying any of that back. I couldn't pass the red face test doing that, so I charge an hourly rate that's yeah. appropriate, I think, for Omaha. Yeah. And if the mediation blows up in three hours, I charge them three hours plus my preparation time. Yeah. Um, but that allows me to pass the red face test every day. And, um, and I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it for the satisfaction of keeping people out of the courtroom and the fulfillment that it gives me to keep people out of the, the courtroom and to deal with them at the worst times of their lives and get them through it. Um, and hopefully a way that, that they can get some closure. So, um, that, I think back to my father who said to both my brother and me that, um, you know, uh, guys, uh, if you can get through your career, uh, it's not about how much money you make. It's, it's, can you pass the red face test every day when you look in the mirror? And if you can do that, you've had a successful career. And I think my, my brother and I both can say we, we've, we've accomplished that. To, to that point and, and being proud of, of what you do and the profession that you're in, um, you have been... Omaha Bar Association president, you've been very involved in bar activities. Um, what's that story? How, how'd you how'd you get started? How'd you get involved? Well, it, it, it was a lot easier to do back when I was uh, a, a litigator. Um, with mediations, you know, you just never know how long it's going to go. And sometimes they're over at 4 or 5 p.m. and sometimes they get over at 10 p.m. And so it's tough for me to, to commit now to going to the monthly OBA dinners. I try to make them if I can. But when I was a younger lawyer, um, uh, you know, the OBA was, was a fantastic opportunity to meet 
other lawyers uh, that were my age, but, but more importantly, to meet the older lawyers, uh, the ones who I'd heard about, had a lot of respect for, um, and, and listen to their war stories and listen to them talk and, and have dinner with them. Uh, so I got a lot out of those OBA uh, uh, opportunities and the dinners and the social events. Uh, I was president of the Barristers Club. That was fun. You know, <laughs> had, we had a lot of fun with those guys. No litigation during your year as Barristers president? Nobody sued you? Or tried to uh, well, sue you? <laughs> I think there was a threat that uh, someone was going to sue us uh, over the Christmas show, but um, uh, I think it was an idle threat because no suit was filed. I will also tell you that when the attorney called me to make the threat that uh, uh, suit was going to be filed, I said, well, you know, I could just tell you this. Um, I saw our bank account last week and it's under $100. So, uh, you know, I don't know that you'll recoup your filing fee if you do <laughs> decide to pursue the, the Barristers Club. And um, so, uh, but I think it was a little bit tongue in cheek. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, but it, was, it was a great time and, and met a lot of great friends uh, during that. Um, and while I have not been able to go in recent years, it's because uh, some very close friends of ours always have their Christmas party on the Thursday right. that the Barristers Club has right. their, their party. And it's really for uh, over 10 years prevented me from going back. I'd love to go back, but on the other hand, this is the, the, the wife of this couple is very, very close friend with my wife and I just have to go. And there's a strong uh, no video taping of the of the Christmas show. Why? Well, yeah, yeah. I've I've asked, but they they decline every year. Yeah, yeah I, and I think that's an appropriate <laughs> rule. I certainly didn't want my year taped. So, well, and it has been one of those things. Looking back through the the list of past presidents for the Bearsters Club, it has been kind of a proving ground for OBA leadership. Mm -hmm. um, you know that collegiality and, and not taking yourself too seriously. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's, while we are separate entities, uh, there, there has been some kind of, you know, uh, similarities between mm -hmm. you do this and, and you're good for, for the OBA leadership too. Well, yeah. And here's the thing, if you're going to get involved in barristers and go to the meetings at which back in my time were kind of weekly, once you got into the season, um, to start writing the skits and talking about different, um, you know, uh, aspects of the performance and the monologue. Um, you know, you're, you're joining, you're, you're, you're becoming part of a group and, and that's the same thing as, uh, becoming part of the OBA, uh, or the state bar association, same thing. And, and I, I got a tremendous benefit from whether it was the Barristers Club or the Omaha Bar Association or even, uh, the state bar association. I served on the house of delegates for God, 15 years or more. And I love that time. Um, I just, by the time I was, um, you know, probably at an age and, and an experience level where I could have gone forward for more uh, leadership positions in the state bar, I just was too busy at that time. And I was trying to actually, it was um, uh, leaving committees that I had uh, uh, joined simply because I couldn't make the meeting. But arguably, uh, your leadership in this area of, of legal practice is as important, if not more, um, than what you could have done as, in the state bar. And I think, you know, my willingness to talk at seminars, and I don't care who the, the, the it may be the, the, uh, uh, the Professional Women's uh, Lawyers Association or, you know, um, employment uh, law groups or whatever. I'm happy to, to do that, and I, I think that probably... Uh, is a better benefit than just having me show up yeah. to think. Do you do anything with um, Creighton's Werner Institute? Have you done anything with that? Or uh, I think I'm still on the advisory board. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, uh, involved from the very beginning uh, at the request of uh, Gail Werner Robinson, whose father was uh, provided the seed money for it. Um, because he had been involved in some litigation and frankly, he didn't like lawyers and he saw that as a way to, to, to move to a better process. And, uh, but, but the family was wonderful and um, I, was, I was really, really uh, pleased that Gail 
uh, decided to consider me for a spot. And I actually served on the search committee that found the initial executive director. And, um, and I thought he did a very nice job um, for a number of years, and then he moved on. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's now changed uh, because Crane University has changed it. And it's now part of the graduate school program rather than part of the law school curriculum. But I think I'm still on the advisory committee. Um, and, um, but I, ha I will tell you, I haven't been to a meeting. It, it, but in terms of you know somebody interested in becoming a mediator, having the the knowledge and the experience of the full litigation process is is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Just just saying straight out, I'm going to become a, a mediator. That's that's tough to do in s civil litigation. Maybe family yeah. law I can work, but yeah. not necessarily for. I I agree with you, and and uh, it brings up I think an important point. I get calls. Um, every year, uh, uh, numerous calls from students that are either in s school at UNL or Creighton Law School or are graduating. And uh, they'll call me up and say they want to meet me, just talk to me about you know mediation as a career. And I'm always happy to do it. In fact, I really enjoy it. Um, but invariably, they say, we want to do what you do. How do we do that? And I have to give them the uh, cold splash of water that it's really hard to do when you don't have name recognition with a bunch of trials under your belt. And, um, and you know, when I started doing mediation, I tried dozens of, of uh, uh, civil trials and had some name recognition. And, and I like to think that I treated everybody, all my opposing attorneys really well. And I got along with almost everybody. Uh, even during the cases that were tried, uh, you know, we do things with a handshake and I never tried to undermine anybody. And I think that helped me because, um, uh, you know, if you, if you get people angry at you, they're never going to hire you as a, uh, as an attorney, as a mediator. But, but the problem is now because there's so much mediation, the younger lawyers aren't getting the opportunity to try cases. Yep. So they're not getting the name recognition. And so it's tough to bring younger mediators into the field. And I wonder what's going to happen when, you know, I, I'm pretty old now, but, you know, I, I, I have no plans to stop working. Um, but, um, but uh, you know, in the last year, I think, uh, uh, well, Con Keating certainly retired. Uh, John Brownrigg, I think, is retiring at the end of this year. And, and um, you know, I think uh, Mike Kinney might be down to four days a week. And, uh, Bob Shively, who's an outstanding mediator, might be taking Mondays off. I talked to Steve Gailey, who's an outstanding mediator, um, and he uh, mediated a, a case for him a few weeks ago. And he said, well, I, I'm not going to mediate on Mondays. I'm not going to do two back-to-back -back mediations on one day, and I'm not going to mediate on successive days. And I said, okay, well, that means you're doing a mediation on Tuesday and a mediation on Thursday if you get hired. And he said he was doing, you know, a couple of mediations a month and he was, he's okay with that. Yeah. You know, he just has reached that age where he doesn't want to work my hours. He doesn't want to stay up all night, doesn't want to read boxes of documents. But, but somewhere, you know, there's got to be someone to fill the void. And Amy's right. trying to fill that. And I know her numbers are going way up, but I don't know about the others. Especially as maybe, I, I, I feel like, we're a more litigious society. There, there, there are more um, people saying, you know, I'll, I'll sue over this instead of um, trying to resolve this another way. So there are more cases um, out there that certainly need to be um, mediated. So yeah, that th there's there's a there's a need mm -hmm. for some some good people to get back in or get into it, but necessarily have that experience, have yeah. that understanding of it. But it's tough to get started. Yeah, I mean. Um, it used to be, you know, every couple of weeks and then it was like every month and now it's not nearly as frequently, but, um, but I used to get letters from, um, you know, typically older attorneys, uh, who had completed mediation training and they wanted to get started as a mediator. And, um, I have to say that the, the, the vast majority of them 
probably never mediated a single case. Right. It's just hard to get started. Yeah. It's tough to get that first mediation. And, and I was lucky I got the first mediation and then I somehow was able to settle it. And I used that as a springboard to get a second case and then I was able to settle that. And then it's just started to go from there. And with each mediation you complete, it gets easier to get the next one. Sure. But boy, it's hard to get that first one. Well, you know, it's one of those things, overtly um, uh, advertising yourself, you know, gosh, golly, I don't want to do that. But at the same time, you need to. I think um, f former judge Bill Connolly has, mm -hmm. has, you know, he's put himself out there. He's he's actively said, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll do this. And sometimes we aren't our best advocate, mm -hmm. our, our best, uh, you know, personal advocate here. So maybe it needs to come with the idea that you want to get into this practice. It comes with an idea of, Maybe I need to do a better job marketing this, right? Well, and I'll tell you, I, I, uh, Justice Connolly was, uh, uh, he called me several times um, after he left the court and uh, told me he was interested in doing that. I had met with him, uh, talked to them a couple times, and uh, um, uh, you know what, I've, I, I, I think he has decided that he would be a better arbitrator because of his time on the Supreme Court. You know, he, he, he never was in a mediation because um, it didn't exist when he was a, a, a trial lawyer. Uh, oh, he's and, been arbitration so Yeah, and, and, but, but as an arbitrator, he's kind of doing what he, what he had done right. as a judge. And right. so I think that's his comfort level. And I've, I've recommended him. I don't like doing arbitrations, but I've recommended him yeah. um, in arbitrations where I've been asked to do them because I just think he's got the right personality. He's a great guy. I think he's very knowledgeable on the law, yeah, obviously, yeah, you know, right. um, but he would be a better arbitrator than I would be. Yeah. Well, and, and that opens a whole can of worms, arbitration um, and that discussion. Uh, I've taken up a ton of your time. I know that you have a, a mediation coming up, obviously you have a mediation coming up. It's a, it's a day of the week you have a mediation. Um, is there anything that I didn't get to that you'd want to say to the people watching, um, any anything we didn't hit any softball question well, that I missed? No, not not about me. I, I you know, and it's really not about me. Um, uh, it's about keeping people out of the out of the courtroom. But I, I feel very 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 lucky that I've been able to do this. But I I have to say one thing, and that is I have to give a lot of thanks to QTAC Rock as a firm. Um, they approached me, uh, gave me an opportunity to do this full time. And, um, and they've done nothing but support my mediation practice. And there's beautiful building and the second floor conference center, fantastic. And uh, besides that, I'm really proud to be affiliated with this firm that takes its diversity uh, and inclusiveness initiatives uh, so seriously. And if I know we're, we're highly ranked in terms of the number of um, uh, female uh, uh, partners here. Um, I think our executive committee now is at least, well, I think it's over a third women uh, serving on it. Um, we have, a, 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 I think, a, a high, one of the highest percentages of LGBTQ uh, attorneys here, and they have their own affinity group here, and we're proud of that, um, and we encourage it and encourage uh, diverse members of the firm. And uh, I heard um, that, for example, last year, we, we as a firm, uh, hired, I think, 25 new partners, and over 50% of them identified as diverse uh, in one classification or another. And, and that makes me very proud to be part of this firm. And I just have to give my thanks to, um, going back to David Jacobson, uh, may he rest in peace, wonderful guy, uh, but he's the one who um, I first met with about coming over here. And then um, his successor, Jay in Kansas City, uh, Mike Curry here in the Omaha office, uh, John Passarelli, who was instrumental in having Amy and myself come over here. Um, and, and I have to give a lot of thanks to Amy as well. I mean, when we were notified on March 20th of 2020 that our office was closing at 5 p.m. that day. Uh, I had a week of mediations the following week, and, and Amy may have had one or two, 
um, that was, she was just getting started then, but um, she spent the entire weekend with her husband and, and I had Joni and we spent 10 hours on Saturday and 10 hours on Sunday and may have been more, but that's my best guess, uh, learning how to host Zoom mediations. Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't have done it without Amy's help. You can't really do Zoom without having someone else to, to put in the breakout rooms and to move around. Um, and so I have to give her a lot of thanks for her help as well. But the firm has been great to me and I, I, would, I would feel very, very bad and, and would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, QTAC Rock for all that they do and all they've done for me. Mm -hmm.